Welcome to the Reef Keeping Secrets Podcast, hosted by Shane Backer at SBB Corals. Listen and learn as we dive deep into the reef keeping industry, interviewing top reef keepers from around the world, from business to hobby. Join us on our journey. Good. How are you? All right. Sitting in my kitchen because I can't be near the computer for some reason. No worries. But well, we're happy to have you. Uh, I'm happy to, to have me. Thanks, Shane, for inviting me on your great show. Are you kidding? <laughs> yeah, I feel like uh, yesterday I said, you know, hey, let's um, let's talk for ten minutes about the, you know, what we're going to talk about, and we ended up talking uh, for like ninety minutes. <laughs> these folks, if they're going to stay all night, you know, we we could we could be doing this for a long time tonight. Yeah, I'm ready. Nice. All right. Yeah, let's let's jump right into it. So for everybody on the call, as you know, um, we have Joe from Tusi's Reef here and I'm, I've been dying to talk to him. So I'm really excited that uh, he was able to join us. Um, what's up, Andrew? I see you giving some heart symbols. What's up, Greg? A um, bunch of people on the call. I love it. So so, yeah, just for everyone here, um, anyone who stays till the end, um, we're going to be giving out a hundred and fifty dollar gift card. So the way that that'll go is um, we'll basically some information that we talk about, I'll ask a question at the end and uh, whoever gets it right will win the gift card. Um, so yeah, without that said, um, we have Joe here, obviously. Um, so Joe, how long have you been in this, uh, in this crazy hobby for? Honestly, not that long in my, uh, compared to some other, you know, reefers that I've, you know, met on forums and now social media. I, I think I started my tank actually started installing my tank 2008. So that's 2008, it's 15 years. So, you know, you know, like, you know, you, know, you go through the installation, you know, the cycling and, you know, started as a uh, LPS softy um, tank. And then, you know, you, um, you always upgrading because you get tired of it. Then uh, you, never think that you're good enough for SPS. So I'm a person that, that like to have challenges where am I good enough, you know? Um, so that's how I ended up in the SPS. And now I'm like more of an SPS guy than a uh, LPS guy. Although, you know, LPS collections of LPS today, they were, they're a lot nicer and better than 15 years. Years ago, I mean, 15 years ago, we couldn't keep. Um, we used to call it the flower pot, you know, a Ghani. We couldn't keep it alive, you know. Like pet stores used to bring them in. It's like you don't touch it because it's not gonna live, you know. So the hobby came a long way. Um, when you when I look back, it's just like amazing. And the same thing with SPSs, you know. Um, uh, you, you you looked for a Horida, which is you know was considered the dirty water you know, acro that will make it in, in, a, in a tank, but you bought um, um, anything, you know, like a Red Planet with an ORA. ORA were like the first ones to start selling SPSs, you know, with the Red Planet, the Pearlberries, the, you know, so that's when we started learning more about how to grow SPSs, to be honest. And, um, and then of course, so I remember when I bought my first uh, Tyree Red Dragon from uh, Greenwich Aquaria, I was like, I was in the hobby maybe three or four years. And what's funny about that coral is that I had more success with that coral then than I'm having now. So what, am I, what are we doing now more than what we didn't know what to do back in the day and the coral survived? and flourished even more which you know I think it has to do with minor trace elements that we are overdoing that maybe it's good for teenuses and millies and not so much for smooth smooth skins in that family you know with the thin branching and stuff so there's still a lot that I'm learning and I'm still a lot that I experiment on my own and try to figure out what is killing this coral, but is flourishing other corals. So I'm finding out that with SPSs, for example, there are certain corals that require different 
trace elements, maybe less of them than others. Um, and again, this is like me talking, so don't, uh, don't do this at home. <laughs> well, one thing I wanted to ask, you know, is you mentioned even yourself, you know, back in 2008, when you first started, you couldn't keep some corals, you know, some of them you couldn't keep. And I guess like just in the last 15 years, like, you know, how have you seen this hobby change, you know, in terms of equipment? Like, do you think now there's just more research out there on how to keep these corals? Like, what do you think it is that you, that we couldn't keep them in 2008 and, and you know, now we can, like, what, you know, why do you think that is? Absolutely. You know, we have so much tools to work with now. And uh, if it's ICP test, for an example, um, I mean, I probably was one of the first, like definitely on Long Island, that I was experimenting with potassium. You know, I mean, the potassium test kit did not exist back in the day. It was um, Lamont, I think, a European company that had a potassium test kit, which I ordered it overseas. I had actually a friend of mine buy it for me overseas and ship it to me um, because they were not selling in the US at the time. And, uh, um, but you couldn't read the test kit. I mean, it, it, it was the stupidest test kit I've ever purchased. And so when I started experimenting with potassium and then, you know, potassium iodide and iodine, but why, um, I started why, why potassium though? Like that to me, like, you know, why not experiment with like alk or calc, you know, like what, well, what got alk, you into potassium? You know, alk and calc at the time, I mean, those were always giving tools. Like you had to have those parameters, you know, on the spot, on the money, you know, you, 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 so, you know, you, we all knew that, you know, you have to keep your alk, your um, magnesium and calcium, you know, up to par. Um, and then if you, you needed more, uh, you know, if you couldn't sustain it, which again, at the time, you could sustain, you didn't need to do calc so much because, you know, you, 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 you sustained it, you know, you didn't have the growth that we're having today, you didn't have the success that we're having today, you had more things dying than flourishing, you know, um, uh, you know, Colors were always not up to par. Now, yes, I always dose, you know, trace elements from Tropic Marine, um, but they were very expensive, you know? And look, the hobby changed, okay? The hobby changed that a hobbyist today getting into the hobby knowing that it's gonna be expensive. When I started out, um, it was expensive, but we were not spending crazy money on calls. You know, I mean, I remember when I bought my first Jason uh, Fox flame tip, that was $120 for a frag, you know, at the time. That was like like $500 today, you know, on a call compared. Because the average call back in the day was 20, 25 bucks. So mm -hmm. I I was crazy. You know, it's like I'm I'm starting out with SPS. I mean, look at this. I've never there was no such coral in the market that was red with a yellow tip. It looked almost fake. You know. When was that? Was that like in 2010? Or yeah. Like... Yeah, it was like 10, maybe 2011. I mean, I, I if I showed you the frack I got from Jason, um, he would say that was the coral. <laughs> it was like a small square on a plug with one yellow dot you know it was not even a noob um well, and then well like a little booger frag yeah. like a really tiny I, and then yeah. yeah and then and then the pc rainbow i believe sonny if he was listening he could correct me um that was also during that time when pc rainbow came around um those were the two hottest calls at the time and i did good so i was very confident so when i was playing with potassium and, and iodine and all that stuff. I was trying to maintain colors and do better, and I did. Um, but now it's like, you know, we're getting into these moonshiners, we're getting into the zinc, and we're getting into the nickel, and we're getting into the selenium and the, the cobalt, and I mean, where do you stop? And we're trying to take everything. We're creating actually 
almost more of a headache if you ask me because now you 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 you're trying to control you know 30 elements versus your dose trace elements from tropic marine a and k you do 5 mLs a day you call it a day and you're done and you send your water out and you're coming you're coming in at um 98% accurate right so what, why are we chasing the 2%? You know, the reason I always suggested that you do the moonshine testing is not to basically that I want to try to start dosing each element daily on my own. I mean, honestly, if I'm at 98, I'm good enough. Even if I'm, if, if I'm I look at it, if I'm at 95, I'm good enough. Um, the re reason is that you want to try to catch something early on, you know. Yeah. That's the, the, the moonshine test. It, I recommend it, you know, um, you know, sending your water out to be tested. I recommend it. I mean, I do it weekly, you know. people. Oh, weekly? Tell, yeah. People tell me I'm nuts. I am a little nuts, but, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know. Um, but I always try to... If I have a trace elements for some reason that is skyrocketing, not knowing, right? And then I'm getting RTN on the coral or I'm getting, um, you know, cyanobacteria, which could also, you know, start from imbalance of elements. Um, I want to catch it early on, you know, and I say, whoa, wait a second here. What's going on? Why is this not being consumed like it used to? And that's why I do it, you know. Um, not that I always have the answer why, you know, but, but looking at your calls, you kind of see why, yeah. you know, sometimes. So, and then, of course, you know, we didn't know back in the day how to control phosphates and nitrates, for example, with um, SPSs. Like, like, you know, we didn't know, like, most, I mean, I would say 99% of tanks, they all had very high nitrates. How did you lower nitrates? You basically did water changes, right? And how many water changes you're going to do to, to to lower, you know, maybe uh, 0.10, you know, on a water change when you need to lower, you know, a lot more than that. So... Um, that's what the technology started coming out where the algae reactors came out and the algae scrubbers came right after that. And, mm. you know, no pox from Red Sea and the carbon dosing and the bacteria and this and that. And, and then we had a period where if you were doing ROA, ferric oxide, mm. for example, to lower your phosphates, it, it affected if you carbon dosed. Mm -hmm. So there was something where it wasn't going well with those two, where you get RTN. So then I got into that craziness, and like, you know what? So first of all, I couldn't stand washing Roa in the wintertime. You know, my wife would not let me clean that in the sink, in <laughs> any sink in my house. So that was out of, out of the question. I would have to be outside in the cold with a garden hose trying to, <laughs> you know, you know, and, and uh, on a freezing day, water is going to freeze as you're doing it. So uh, I, I had to figure a way how to do it naturally and get rid of that. And um, when I bought my first bale, you know, algae reactor and carbon dosing and all of that, and did the Zeovit um, rocks, the zeolites. I tell you, Shane, it was a life changing for me. Mm. I've never looked back. I don't do ROA. I mean, my nutrient levels are always what do you, very low. You keep your, what do you keep your nutrients at now? I like them at 100 to 1, um, which like 0 0.05 to 5 ppm of nitrates. So that's where I like to stay around. I mean, depending on how much I feed, depending if I have a coral dying or something happening or a fish that died and you didn't even know, 
mm. and it can play with those numbers a little bit because you don't realize it. Um, that's where I like to be. And when they creep up, um, I basically, um, for FOSSES, I do the, um, mm. the, the FOSS RX, which, which what, is what basically... Do you, you keep your phosphate at? I think your nitrate, you said like zero to five, like something no, half it, to five. Nitrate, nitrates are five ppm and uh, the phosphate at 0 0.05. 0 0.05, okay. Yeah, right. yeah, 0 0.05. So, um, I try to stay within that 100 to 1, you know, game. And the reason I always preached about 100 to 1, because I was told by, um, what's his name? The guy that builds the uh, Pax Balaam. Mm. Um, he goes, that is the ratio that you want to be. Mm -hmm. And, and um, he's a very, very smart guy and a uh, nice guy at the same time. And that's, it, it works for me. Um, and then, you know, that got rid of my ROA, you know, uh, the force guard and all that nonsense, you know, so it's very natural. You know, when I see the something creeping up, I go in the reactor, I say, okay, the algae is overgrown, remove some, because what you don't want to do, what, what's happening with the ROA, for an example, and I, I say this to whoever is listening, be careful because... You need to check your liquid coming out into your tank, right? You're running it through your reactor. Test that water. When you start mm -hmm. getting readings on that, you know mm -hmm. that the ROA is basically exhausted, right? Now, a lot of guys will go and just empty the tank, fill new. What happens is you strip the water in your tank so fast because you just put new ROA, that you're going to get Arthea. Mm. And it ha happened to me at the beginning when I didn't know this. And what I started doing is I started basically not changing all of it. So I, I used to add new and mix it with the old. I used to wash it separately and mix, put new with old ROA. So basically, you never have 100% you know, brand new batch. So you, you don't strip the water too fast. All you want to do is basically when you get a small reading, bring it back to zero coming out. And it worked for me. Um, it worked for me and I stopped that. But I still had to get rid of the fact that I had to clean this crap. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. I couldn't deal with it. Um, so do you uh, still, so you don't use it anymore no. or? Nothing. Okay. I don't do, yeah. I basically carbon dose, um, you know, do bacteria. I use some no no pox, very little, which I use it more for the purpose of um, um, almost like a food, you know, for the bacteria. But then I also use um, the Bacto Balance, mm. which is made by Tropic Marine, where it is also helps with the nutrient levels. And that I found also works very well and, and not as chemically, uh, you know, uh, affecting your water, right? So what it does, I believe, it, uh, it binds um, nutrients in the water column that then your skimmer is basically pulling it out. Pull, mm -hmm. pulling it out. And Shane, it, it works. Um, uh, and it's I mean, I, is that to bring your nutrients yeah. down, or is that just to, to... to keep my nutrients level down? Um, and then you can control how much you dose as what you need where you want to be. I mean, you dose a lot, you're going to strip everything. You're going to have zeros. And and what I always said is like, what is zero? How lower than, than zero? We can only test zero. Yeah. We don't know how lower than zero we are. You know, it's like you're showing zero and you start adding you know, um, inorganic uh, nitrates, and you're still at zero. And you dose for a whole, whole week, and you're still at zero. So how lower than zero were we? Stripping. Yeah. So I don't want to go there. I mean, I, I like everything organic. I don't like dosing phosphates. I don't like dosing nitrates. I want to stay organic versus inorganic because nutrients are better organic than inorganic. So, um, because when you, 
you're dosing an organic material, basically, and you're going because you need to, right? Um, it takes time, and then it shoots up. Now mm -hmm. you, now your numbers shot up. Now you're fighting to bring those numbers. Where you, so you're adding some. We do it to ourselves because we don't do it slowly. Um, like for example, think about it this way, right? And these are all things that I try to tell, like young hobbyists starting out. And if we knew this when we started out, if you started in a tank and you cycled it and you added, and we right away run and buy a lot of fish because mm. we want to have fish. Now you're already creating nutrients, but you have nothing to eat it. Mm -hmm. You have nothing to take it in. So you're building these nutrients in everything. Now you're tr trying to lower it. And so if you add a balance of, I'm going to buy one fish, I'm going to buy one coral. I'm going to buy another fish, I'm going to buy another coral. And you start from the beginning with these things. You will never allow your nutrients to skyrocket. You can almost mm -hmm. keep them check and balance from the beginning. You know, you, you, you don't need to go insane removing you know one thing because you got you're feeding too much or you're not feeding enough so uh, that's what i try to um to say and again depends on the guidance you have it depends what you have what animals you have what i mean look if you have lps there's a lot of a lot of hobbyists like to feed their tank you know i never fed my tank i nothing. never fed nothing i never fed fed one coral in my life you know but you do feed fish food though right feed fish that's feed it. the fish yeah that's yeah, it me too i don't feed the corals at all i don't feed the corals at all so now you get these guys well you know they're trying to uh do, you know grow uh, shrooms or zoos or uh you know type lps's and they're feeding their their, their corals i mean what you're doing is you're 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 feeding the coral the coral is consuming all this food the rest is going to go in your water right now now you fed your fish your coral is already fed where is mm -hmm. you building your nutrients by overfeeding per se okay okay and that's where a lot of hobbies gets in trouble where now they're 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 they're, they're running around to, to to lower nutrient control your feeding come with a method that's going to work for you if you are going to feed your corals, try to feed them with at the same time maybe with fish food. Mm. So this way. You and what 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 kind of food do you use? I'm sure people I, are asking. You know what kind I of food? Use, um, I only use frozen. You know, um, frozen food. You know, never used pellets. I've never ever used pellets. Um, you will not find that in my house. <laughs> um, uh, I do a mixture of, you know, um, cyclopes and things. If, uh, I do feed a lot of very, very small particle food. And that the reason for that is for the corals mm -hmm. at the same time mixed with the fish food. So in theory, I am feeding the corals at the same time, but I will not go and direct feed a coral like some, some reefers do, which I watch, which, again, if it works for them, God bless. Yeah. You know, maybe they have a very big um, way of removing nutrients that they need to do that. So uh, what I'm saying is, is like every reefer is different than another. There's mm -hmm. no one instruction book for all, you know. And, um, I just like to share my experiences that I failed on or maybe I didn't have the technology or the tools in my hands at the time um so a lot of people don't make mistakes because what i what i don't like is to hear like you see them on social media you see them on like reef to reef on the forums like that's it i'm, I'm throwing the towel i can't take this hobby anymore <laughs> you know um, and it's sad because it's probably something simple that they're doing and they're getting out of the hobby you know yeah 
And the whole idea about like I'm older than the most. Um, I started late in the hobby. It's a beautiful hobby, and um, you know we need to grow it. I mean, this what we're doing. You know, I mean, maybe some people will not agree. I mean, at some point we're saving the yeah. the ocean. I mean, in a sense, yeah. you know, if the ocean was to really something bad happen. There's probably enough corals around that we can donate back, mm -hmm. you know, in a sense. Um, so you know, it, it, it's a journey. Yeah. But now it's it's just basically sustaining the journey and maintaining it. You know, it's just. Uh, and again, I'm like, my tank have been the same tank for 15 years. I've never, I, I redo the corals and stuff like that because it overgrows and. Um, other than that, I mean, I don't vacuum the sand bed. I don't change the sand bed. I don't do anything. It's just all original. So, so you mentioned um, that you send in a reef moonshiners test every week. So, are you actually dosing every individual element? The only reason why I'm asking is because somebody asked earlier in the in the chat. I think their question was, are those all in one, you know, uh, trace element solutions? good i mean my opinion is that they're not because you will eventually overdose your tank with something in there and unless you're doing the test every week you won't know so it just brings me to the question to you like are you Correct. dosing individual elements like how are no. you no i'm not um i am dosing the tropic marine a and k which is two bottles obviously um one bottle let's say carries have uh, zinc, nickel, iodine, potassium, whatever chemical chemicals could be mixed as one. Not every mm -hmm. chemical can be mixed as one, you know. But they come into buy you know the bottle. It tells you if, if people look it up on the internet, it will tell them what let's say A have in it and what the K have in it. So I dose dose daily. Um, the moonshiner come back and it tells me. Um, your potassium is high mm. or your iodine is high, right? Now, how do you control the potassium and, and, and iodine when, and then you got to look at that bottle and say, okay, what else is in this bottle? You know, let's say molybdenum, selenium, you know, uh, bromine, but those are good on the moonshine, right? So those are at a level, but again, now what level are those? Are, are, creeping a little high are they in the middle when your potassium is strictly so what that's telling you is that you need to dose less to bring the potassium and iodine in check if you cannot do, do that now you need to figure out how you're going to remove some of the iodine and the potassium right because everything else is good that that's how i eliminate that problem now if i am under dosing on those but i like where i see them on the moonshine test and i want to creep a couple of things up that's when i dose only dose just a little bit separately but the mm. majority i am doing basically um like i believe i'm doing seven mls a day off each bottle and and what was that called again? That was the Tropic Marin. The Tropic Marin A and K. It's A and K. Yeah. Got it. So I guess you basically have your own method where you are so confident with that specific elements, yeah. so you know exactly what's in that specific, you know, Tropic Marin A and K. So if something's a little high or a little low, you know that you can maybe make it up with maybe one of the elements. Correct. So it. This is so I guess basically for everyone on the call, what you need to realize is, you know, maybe an all in one solution is good, but you need to be the master at what is in that specific bottle right. and do your, your, your weekly or every, every two weeks test. Right. And the, the, the bottle itself tells you what's in them. You know, it's, it's a group of elements in each. And um, look, the way I see it is like this also. Right. Um, one thing is that when a bottle tells you, gives you instructions, those this for 200 gallons, 
they don't tell you to dose this for 200 gallons packed with SPSs or packed with mm. LPSs or it's one instruct it doesn't work most of these manufacturers what is that telling you what is that that what that is telling you is that these chemicals whatever they are they're so diluted okay that you can only have a bottle of something with one instructions for all without mm -hmm. knowing what that tank have in it unless you're selling water <laughs> because otherwise you will kill some somebody's tank right yeah so like you take these chemicals, individual chemicals, let's call them, right? Does it have instructions how much it does? They give you a chart. Does it say what is the proof of it? Do you know if it's 99% water and 1% really chemical, right? So there's a lot of questions that needs to be answered, okay? And we're feeding into these, these things because we think that that is a better method. But when you buy a Tropic Marine A and K, which is a 500 milli, uh, milliliters mm -hmm. in a bottle, mm -hmm. and you're only dosing, think about it this way, right? You're only dosing five ml for a tank like mine that's packed. What does that tell you? That's telling Very you that concentrated. It's <laughs> concentrated. Okay? So you got to use your common sense because where did these companies come to bring all these separate trace elements it's came after and then they created the icp test mm. and this that and the other and you get you could get caught in a in a whole thing that you don't need to you know so i mean what i like about them is that and i believe triton was the first company that created this system mm -hmm. and if you looked at the triton bottles they were not bottles this big. They were a small bottle that big. So why a small bottle like this can do this, this many gallons versus a bottle like this can do the same? Something isn't, you know, connecting, in my opinion. But again, I'm not here to, to, to judge, you know, trace elements, but again, I like, uh, you know, I've been doing this method since I started, okay, and, and it works for me, and I'm not going to change it. I do those separate, only those elements that I would need to dose if I choose to bring, let's say, the, the chart of the, 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 the ICP test to bring it in the middle. Again, you want to be somewhere in the middle. You don't want to be, you know, on the higher side because then you you, you, you're in a sense if you have almost high nickel, almost high zinc, but you have low molybdenum or you have low, again, you're not running parallel. Which, if you go to the fauna marine, you know, which I like a lot, I mean, you know, I really believe in Claude because from all these ICP test companies, you could name me if I'm wrong. Only Fauna Marine also grow a farm. Mm. Okay? They're the only ones that grow corals. Mm -hmm. You know, all the other ones are taking your water, send you a result, have a good day. You know, yeah. Claude is experimenting with all these elements also on his own farm. So he knows what can, you know, you know, cause if you have molybdenum with selenium going parallel, and when I say parallel, they have to be right there. You, 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 you can still have one on the lower side, one on the higher side, and they're not going to be as parallel as they should. They could give you, uh, they can give you RTM or STM, mm. or they can get. So Claude is experimenting with all of this, not just to give you an ICP test. He's also basically looking at a parallel type of trace elements in the whole system so um you know and, and i like that now you know some other person will tell you oh you know you, you, that's not accurately correct um again i'm not a chemist i'm not you know but 
I do understand that because, and I do believe that because you don't need to be high on something. You could be higher on something when you're lower on something else, and it could also do the same damage. So, so with, so, so okay, so with the 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 the, the trace elements that you dose, right? The Tropic Marin A and K, as you mentioned, like what do you find yourself having to dose? more of like what are you lacking and 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 is it consistent like week to week you said you do the test every single week do you notice that it's consistent or all of a sudden like the molybdenum is low or the iron is high like you know is it does it just random like that like what what do you actually need to do more it depends if you, you missed a water change it depends if you didn't do you know or, or you did a water change so because if you do a water changes right um and that's the thing, uh, you know, in the summertime, my tank can go a little bit out of whack because I don't do water changes. In the wintertime, I do. Um, because my water where I live is horrible. And I, you know, the chemicals they, they throw and stuff like that, it just, I don't think that my RO system can remove it. I, you know, mm -hmm. like I have more problems with if I was to have, have RTN or SCN in the summertime than in the wintertime. Um, what I've found that always is the culprit is nickel and zinc. Mm. Nickel and zinc, they happen to be always low for some reason. Um, boron, not always. Um, but then potassium and iodine and iron, I'm always a little bit high. And that could have something to do with my algae reactor depending if it is half empty or is three quarters full so i try to keep it you know half empty all the time and then those levels come down and they maintain so i'm always in the range i mean i i look at it that i'm always like 98 percent you know um you know i've been dealing with getting a different ro system actually dealing with silicone and silicates that is not being removed by my my ro system which i'm working on that actually i talk with what, aqua shell i what the guy that what kind of uh what kind of ro system you mean the rodi system what kind yeah. of system do you use i have a simple regular system that everybody has is the uh the barracuda you know four four port um Dual system membrane. Brain. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I want to get into a little bit more sophisticated system to remove these silicates and, and, and possibly also the silicon um, from the water. Uh, because those. Uh, just, just question how, how often do you change your membranes for those? Um, the membrane. I think I do it every, I don't know, three, four months. Okay. Yeah. I mean, we, we change ours every two months. People think we're crazy, but if we, if it goes over two months, we, we start seeing the I mean, pops you, recede. I don't know why, but. You know, I mean, do you, 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 you check your TDS meter coming out if it's zero, um, you know, it's still working fine. I mean, I check it often, you know, and if you, if you have zeros, you, you know, you're good. The only thing is that uh, the silicates and the silicon, it's, it's, it's having a problem. And that's like on every ICP test is showing high. So, yeah, people, people think I'm crazy because I change it every two months. But, you know, the thing is, if I let it go, it's always zero. I can, I can not change it for six months and it's zero, four months, zero. But we change it every two months because if if we let it go more than two months our polyps recede and you know we get less growth i don't know why i think something's getting through that we can't test so i'm wondering if if maybe you tried that but i have i do have a question though so you said that you do water changes in the winter but not the summer do you see when you do water changes do you see like better growth better coloration or do you see that when you don't do water changes or do you see a difference um I don't know that I do. Um, as far as growth is concerned, I think um, it has to do with certain other trace elements, right? Like 
um, uh, take it, take, take, look at it like this, right? You go in the summertime. You go to the beach. If you don't put a, uh, a sun lotion on you, you're gonna get burnt mm. by the sun. Corals tend to do the same thing with our lights, especially LED lights. You know, so. It does have to do with your trace elements because some of these trace elements are the sun lotion mm. on those corals. So the coral is saying, oh my God, you're giving me way too much light because your trace elements are low. They stop growing. Now, why does that have anything to do with your question? Is it summer or winter? So mm. as far as growth is concerned, keep an eye on that because that affects affects growth. Now, in a case of like myself, if I'm not doing water changes, mm -hmm. I have to be careful more with those trace elements because I really have to stay on top of the game. If I'm doing water changes, this is like, like think about it this way, right? Um, I met a guy at well, Aquashella and he came to me, uh, hey Tusi, how you doing? Nice to meet you, which was great because, you know, I've started putting faces to names, you know, that, that you interact with on social media. And he was saying something about the moonshine. I said, look at it this way. Do you moonshine on your water mix? Your <laughs> freshly water mix. If you moonshine your freshly water mix, you don't have to do anything to your tank, mm. just water change. So if you choose a pattern that you want to do water changes every week, but you got to do it every week. You know, you can't say, I don't feel, I'm tired, I don't feel like, you've got to do it every week, right? If you moonshine your water mix, your freshly batched water mix, so what are you going to do? You're going to send your, if you're using Tropic Marine Pro salt like I do, if you're using reef crystals, whatever you're using, send that water around for an ICP test, okay? Dose whatever needs to be dosed in that mix, in that salt. Bring that 100%. Mm -hmm. Do water changes with that you're done you're done you don't have to worry about your tank okay so do you prefer water changes or no water changes because i'm wondering if you can do the no. same thing with no water changes why why even do them in the winter um i i do like water changes because you're removing you know yellow compounds you're removing mm. other things from the water that we don't test for i mean what icp test is there that tests for nitrogen None. I think Triton does. I'm not sure. Okay. So there are things that we're not testing for. Okay. So that's what's good about the water changes. But the reason I don't do it in the summertime is because the water where I live, you know, I mean, they add so much chemicals to the water because you're getting, you know, we have well water, you know, mm. like you live in an area where you're getting, you know, your water is coming from rainwater is one thing. But when you're getting well water, you know, between fertilizers and gardeners and spraying of trees and, mm. and pollen and all that stuff, it's going back down the water table and it's being pumped by where I live and sending to me, you know. So they, they need to control it by adding additional stuff. And that's the reason why I don't, I try to stay away from water changes summertime. And I did have better success of less, you know, cause dying. Um, but yeah, no, I do believe in water changes. Um, but I've heard, heard some people saying, you know, oh no, we don't do water changes at all, and we're only doing moonshiner. And mm -hmm. you know what? I'm not gonna say it's not gonna work. It's working. But I can tell you, I don't think it's gonna work in 15 year tank like mine. Okay. Because so, what? Because of the other things that are building you, up. So oh oh, I see. You're gonna build up. Now, look, when we start new tanks, we're all successful in most cases if we do the basic, mm -hmm. right? Um, you see corals growing faster. You, 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 again, different, different reasons why. You're getting better flow through, you know, you don't have any big colony in the way that's blocking others. You don't have uh, corals washing would flow on, onto others, because that's another thing. But, you know, 
It's a 15-year-old sand bed. It's a 15-year-old rock. It's 15-year-old of everything. The this. if you have, uh, you know, uh, bad things in there, they're going to build up. So if you don't do a water change, you're going to tell me that you're never going to do a water change in 15 years and you <laughs> think your tank is going to continue to grow the way it's growing, I would, I would love to see that if I was to live another 15 years and watch that same tank, you know, because I don't think it's going gonna, it's gonna to play out as, as people might think. But again, I might be wrong. Um, these are my theories that um, you do need to do a water change. So what does a water change to the ocean? No, we don't do water changes in the ocean. The tide. I was going to say, hey, low tide, high tide. Low tide, high tide. So the ocean is doing a water change. But we choose not to do a water change when, when we started out, water changes was the key to success. Mm. So look where we're going. And all of this is why, because of, my, of trade elements that we can control, has nothing to do with it. You know? Mm -hmm. So that is a theory that I don't agree with, unless someone can prove me wrong. But um, if you moonshine your water, your mix, I think is the way to go. Because what do you mean by that? You mean you mean your top off your your new salt water? You're saying right. moonshine you, that you, water and then do the water, water changes water. with that. What happens is this, right? If, if you send an ICP test on Tropic Marine, let's say. Um, some elements are going to be low. Some elements are going to be perfect. Some elements could be even a little higher, right? Now, you go to reef crystals. Um, why is reef crystals cheaper to buy than, let's say, Tropic Marine? It's a salt because mm -hmm. some of these chemicals are very costly, mm -hmm. okay? Okay, so let's say your fluoride in the salt is minute, is barely there, right? Or your boron is barely there, but it's there. If you were, if you were to test it, it's there, but it's not at the par where you need it. So that's where costs on some of these salts is. It's in these chemicals that are added, which basically... I'm calling them chemicals, but they're really trace elements, right? So if you, you send that for an ICP test, and then you correct those levels with, with adding the chemicals, right? Now, now you have perfect mm. water in every mm. element, right? Now you're doing water changes for that. We can, we can, we can, we can, right? You have, probably going to have a better success because while you're doing a water change, you are really adding the trace elements up to par. Now, if you are adding trace elements as I am, you're going to be maybe tra adding one, two mLs a week, mm. a, a day, sorry. So that's what, 10 mLs in a week, you know, 14 days, seven days, whatever you're doing, you know, it's nothing. You know, it's really nothing. Um, so what you're and so you should do it though to your tank's needs, right? Like there's not like because I was gonna say like, well, why doesn't a company just make like the perfect salt? But I guess it's it all be, tank specific. It would, it would be too expensive, and other companies are gonna lose out because we're not gonna buy the bottles individually and and so on and so forth. So it's all it's a business, you know. Yeah. I mean, everybody have a niche in this in this you know, hobby that we created for them, in a sense. You know, they, they're creating the product for us, and we continue to create even more for them because we are now getting involved into more complicated corals, let's call them. You know, if we took a speciosa coral, mm. I mean, we're, think about it. We're, we're getting, we're complicating ourselves and then, you know, a, a psycho like myself, you know, <laughs> I would buy the coral that keeps dying on me more and more and more because I feel I'm failing. But I, 
So I saw your Speciosa though. It looks great in the videos that you post. Well, oh, maybe one out of ten that mm. does great, and the other nine don't. So there's still a lot to learn about these animals. That um, you know, um, is that we're, we're, the hardest coral for you to keep the Speciosa? Um, yeah, I would. I mean, it, it would be one one of. I'm trying to think what others. Um, probably, yeah, I would say, yeah. For us, it, it's a tough call. Too, yeah. yeah. For it, us, too, yeah. For it, we are get, getting there in terms of success with it. Um, we, for me to call success with a speciosa is that if if I can keep a coral for one year then i succeeded if i keep but then after a year it just it, for me speciosa is like almost like a ticking time bomb right like I, I don't know why i don't know what i i've talked to some other people who have speciosa who don't do water changes who subscribe to a hundred percent reef moonshiners method and for some reason it seems like theirs do better so i don't know if speciosa just don't like the the changes i mean what are you I mean, I see, again, your speciosa that you have that you post on your Instagram, like, it, it looks like it's really grown. So I, I know you definitely have success with it. Um, it's all about the animal being healthy from day one. Like, why do we get, it doesn't matter, it, it doesn't need to be speciosa, and you could probably attest to this, where you buy, you can buy um, a, a con of Athenius, right? And it's doing well, doing well, doing well, and after four months, it's gone. Because that, that animal took four months dying slowly. So, mm. you know, we, we kept it alive for four months and then it died. It didn't die that day that now we're sending water to an ICP test because we have something. No, nah, that animal started, you know, had been dying slowly, right? Which we didn't know. So, speciosas kind of do the same thing. Um, I believe the failure with them back in the day when they were coming from Malaysia, it was the trip from mm. Malaysia. It's so far away that if you, if it was shipped with the same water the whole trip, there was no way it's going to make it, yeah. right? And when you mean back in the day, do you mean like in 2008 yeah. when you first started? Or do you mean like, no, no. oh, okay. Recently, I mean, we learned a lot. You know, when I say back in the day, it's when, we, when it came into the market. You mm. know, I remember when I used to go with Rada at BK Cab mm. at the time, and he was the only one bringing them in. Um, he was having major issues with them. He lost a lot of money on those calls, too. Um, so... It was ending, costing him crazy money at, at the time where they started shipping even one coral in one box of one. I think this was like 2019, right? Yeah. 2018, 2019? Yeah. 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 Um, I still can tell you that the nicest speciosis I've ever seen in my life is the one he, he had in his own personal time. I've yeah, I agree. I, I've been to his house. So you've been yeah. to his house, I think, in Westchester, right? In New Rochelle. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's where I grew up, actually. <laughs> okay. I mean, I have not seen those calls again. Yeah. Those pets again. So we've learned about them. So I, I still think that the shipping of them have a lot to do with the health of them to, to, to a point. So when you buy a Speciosa, depending where you buy it, who you buy it from, um, I've heard now that they're, 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 when they get them, they're also um, medicating them and putting them in Cipro mm. and, and things like that, um, which have been, been helping a lot. Um, so we're, we're succeeding. You know, we, we are succeeding with them. Now, as far as keeping them al alive in our, in our hobby, it also comes down to, to what is our system, what is our lighting, what is our water quality, what do they require, is it high light, low light, um, where did it come from, is it, uh, you know, so we still have 
you know, things to learn. But um, I've also, also noticed that, you know, fragging them, we're succeeding because they're truly encrusting and tr they're, 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 so we are succeeding in that part. But if you're going to try to buy a colony and continue to grow the economy, I, I don't see it yet. Mm. I don't think favorable yet. So, so, so um, you mean actually it's, it, you mean, so you mean like someone buy a full colony and try to grow that into a bigger colony opposed to someone getting a frag, growing that into a colony, then it's more sustainable that way is what you're saying. Yes. Mm. Yes. Um, it, it, it's, um, I've had a lot of them and I've, you know, played with it, you know, when I broke them up and created frags, frags do very, very well. Um, mm -hmm. So to, to the point of someone going because they want to have a colony of the Speciosa, I recommend not to go, you know, because you might fail on it, you know, buy half of it, buy a piece of it, you know, um, you have, might have a better chance for some reason on those type of costs. Now, you go to, you know, Tingis's and Millie's and, um, and things like that, you have a better shot that it will continue to flourish. Although, you know, cutting the, 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 the concrete that they're shipping these calls out is a key. That concrete, yeah. Yeah. And it, it, that, that concrete, because that's what they use. I think it's like, uh, um, it's, it's, I think it's actually like, toxic material right yeah. that they're using it's like car bondo or something yeah it's creating it's creating a problem and it's killing those calls you know um on uh almost on an average of three months mm. if you believe it or not so do you um, think like for example if those those corals right like they're in indo and i guess they they put them on those bases the energy of the ocean maybe the coral can stay alive but then when people bring them in to their tanks they just start deteriorating right like with that that material on them yes and and and, and you if you flip it over sometimes you see rust on them you know um when you break it with a knife you could almost smell it you can can you yeah. we do smell it yeah you can all yeah we know it we know it's toxic i mean concrete in water especially in an aquarium is toxic yeah oh yeah you know, yeah. You know it, 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 i've worked in construction all my life and poured concrete all my life and we stripped foundations all my life and when you strip a, a foundation wall and the the concrete is still hot and it's basically um, smoking. You could, in the winter time, you could see, you know, like smoke coming out of it. I mean, you smell it. It's not healthy. It's very cancerous and stuff like that. So imagine you're putting that in the water and a coral growing on it. I mean, these are, is what they use, and I don't know why they use that, why no it's one cheap. Has you know, they're cheap and they don't care. You know, they die, we buy more, you know. They don't care. And, yeah, it's cheap. Yeah. Especially when you bring that into such a small environment, you know, it just, it, it's not like yeah. the ocean where it's like unlimited, you know, flushing it. To me, you know, it's important to, my goal is to keep animals alive, right? And that's what I'm always like trying to search for why. That's one why. You buy the Indo stuff, cut it out, glue it on another piece, you know, and crust it. I guarantee you that coral is going to do well. You know, mm -hmm. obviously, you got to keep it clean from, you know, flowers and stuff like that. But um, have you run into any of those type of pests? You know, I mean, I know you're, you're, you know, your big SPS now. I mean, have you, do you have a quarantine system? Like, how do you prevent that stuff? Um, I don't have a quarantine system. I do have a grow out which before I put them in there, I, I dip, dip, dip. And like I said, cut off. Once you cut the rock off, you already, if there was, if there was flatworms on that coral, you already have way there because any egg is going to be on that rock. Yeah. So, well, I mean, even like 
like a, like a frag, like if someone on the call right now is joining, you know, and they're getting frags, you know, from other vendors and stuff like that. I mean, you know, I, I always say like quarantine obviously is the best thing. Always dip the corals, but you know, it, how do you protect against stuff? I mean, what if there's like a little egg, like in a crack or something that they can't um, see, you know, how do you. Buying a frag from a source, you have to know the source. You have to know that source. I mean, if you're buying a frag from a pet store, you know, you're going to be, I'm not saying that pet stores have flatworms, but there's a better chance that the pet store is going to have flatworms because they have a lot of import corals coming in, going out. They don't have time to quarantine. If a pet store was to quarantine every coral, you know, they, they will have to have three stores, right? <laughs> to, to maintain what they sell. So, um, if it's encrusted, you know, it, it does pay to either glue around the encrustation on the plug itself. So that this way at the edge, because eggs normally are not on a skeleton, right. unless the skeleton is eaten up and it, then it becomes very obvious, right? So it's always under a crevice or whatever. So, you know, you glue it, make sure you dip it, um, Keep it to the side. If you have it, a grow up, keep it to the side. Just keep an eye for the first, let's say, month. Mm -hmm. Coral will show you. You know, it will show you. Now, <clears throat> flatworms are not as bad as make, be, make, people make them to be, right? Mm -hmm. The truth is, how much do you care? If you're going to buy a car throw it in your tank and expect that it's going to grow to a calling to frag to sell it to others in a month or, or two months and not paying attention to it it's not going to happen so pay attention to your coral is the color still there is your elements your water changes all of the, the stuff that we discussed is being maintained the minute the coral start not to do well you know what Something is not. Something is wrong. There's something on. It could be red bugs. It don't have to be flatworms. You know. Um, I mean, I could see a flatworm from a mile away. I cannot see a bug if I'm looking at a red bug if I'm looking at it. You know. So, so um, it's not as bad as some people make them to be. I lost my whole tank to flatworms. Hello, dude. You are not paying. You're not dipping. You're not. You're not trying, right? Paying attention. You're not even looking at your tank. Right. Right. Because right. If you are looking at the tank, you did not get an infestation overnight. You know. Um, so these are the things, and that's why I don't care about a quarantine because I am anal with the stuff and I know what to look for. But the indoor stuff, all the stuff, chop it out. Forget about that encrustation that's on that coral. Just cut it out, re-glue it, let it encrust on your piece of whatever, tile or whatever you want to use. If you want to use a piece of rock or rubble or whatever. And, um, and I guarantee you that if you did that coral and nothing came out of it, you got rid of the eggs. You don't have flowers. Yeah. You don't need to yeah. wait six months to quarantining and all of that. It's, that's... That's stuff from the past because we didn't even know what flatworms were. Back. I remember the first, you know, the first time the person that taught me about this stuff was Dan Regal, mm. you know, which a lot of people know. I mean, the guy is an OG. I mean, like, I still respect him until today, mm. you know, mm. because. We hope you're enjoying this episode. Thank you for listening to SBB Coral Reef Keeping Secrets Podcast. If you like the content, all we ask is for you to please share with your friends and comment, as that's the only way we can spread the word and grow this channel. Um, you know, it's when that uh, the Bowie stuff started coming in. I mean, we used to pay 30 bucks at the pet store for a, a colony from, 
for the stuff. And I bought a Millie. <coughs> and when I bought it, it was nice, beautiful. It was a Sunset Millie, hairy and all of that. And all of a sudden, the, the pilot extension started going away. And I'm like, well, what the hell is going on? And I pulled it out and I turned it around. And Shane, it was loaded with eggs. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm like, holy mother. <laughs> you know, and this was like early on, you know, like, Jesus Christ. Um, who am I going to call? You know, I called Dan. And he goes, I said to him, Dan, and I said, I met you at a show um, in New York. I said, you don't know me, guys, but I, I'm very fond of your tank because he was on the call magazine at the time. And um, I said, I got flat. I said, what do you recommend I do? He goes, he goes, Joe, he goes, I already like you. He goes, <laughs> because, he goes, because most people have flatworms and they will never admit it. Oh. Because you telling me you have flatworms and you're asking me for it. And he told me what to do. And that's and I started learning. And and then I got possessed with learning about these creatures, what they do, how they multiply, what's the timing, what's not, and all of that. And um I see a flatworm today. Um I don't I don't you know You don't flinch. Yeah. Yeah. But have you? Did they have like dip back then, or that was just like something that was created for for the problems that now that are there? No, there was dips. There was all. There was dips. Yeah. Have I mean, you seen? Um, I see on the internet all these pictures of these like black bugs. Have you seen those? I mean, that, I've seen red bugs. Yeah, black bugs you don't want to have. That that you don't want to have. I mean, that there's nothing will kill those suckers. So I think yeah, something. That, Thing that kills those actually is the Exodus dip from uh, Reef Moonshiners. Okay, I so never, yes, thank God I never had black black bugs. Um, but if you get black bugs on a coral and you don't catch it like right away, it probably will be too late to dip it because they will destroy a coral overnight. Yeah, and they'll yeah, eat it overnight. Red bugs I did have. Um, interceptor, clean it up. I mean, there is a lot of SPS guys that do that, like literally every six months or even less, regardless if I if they have red bugs or not. Um, mm -hmm. um, I only do it if I only did it once. I did two treatments, and that was it. I, I have a lot of you know um, cleaning crews and stuff like that, and I don't want to kill them. You know, I, oh I, yeah, that's the truth. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the, the crabs, they'll decimate the crabs. I, when I had to do that treatment, it took me two weeks to catch all the crabs before I do the treatment because I would not kill anything. So yeah. I used to put set up traps with food at night when the fish goes to sleep, so the crabs go in the trap to eat that food and catch them every night, every night, every night until I basically had nothing. The only Two things I lost were I had a pair of harlequin shrimps that they would not go in that, obviously. And, um, you know, but yeah, I mean, look, buying corals could bring diseases. Um, dipping them, um, potassium chloride is a little less harsh, on, let's say, on a new delivery. You don't want to put revive or anything like that because those corals are already stressed. Um, putting coral in iodine dip um, or um, dipping them, you know, even if you left them, you know, in Cipro for arguments, mm. it doesn't have to be a flatworm. It could be a disease of other thing if it's uh, if it's a you know, a, a torch, for example. If you, let's say you bought a torch, you know, and it had brown jelly on it. It's, you know, so it does pay to, you know, follow some procedure so this way you don't introduce it, you know, into more. Because if you're not going to, because even if you quarantine it, think about it this way, right? If you quarantined it, it's like you're quarantining a fish. Mm -hmm. So you have one fish in medication, right? And then 
two weeks, and you want to put this for, for a month, for argument's sake. But now you bought another fish. You, what, you're going to, do you have another tank? I mean, you, you, you know, we're hobbyists. We're not pet stores, yeah. right? Um, you put that fish with that other fish, that's it. That, that, that cycle is over. That other fish has to start over. So it's how do you quarantine a coral? If you add a coral in, in a coral that's being quarantined, you didn't quarantine anything, you know? Yeah. Starting it over. You're starting over. So uh, it's, it's people say, oh, I quarantine everything. No, you know, it, it's very difficult. I mean, you know, like yourself, yes, I believe it because you have the systems, you have the space, you have the water. But for a hobbyist like myself, you know, I yeah, you got to really, you really got to inspect everything when it comes in, right? Yeah. I mean, you really got to check it and make sure that it's, I think, you know, I think it's okay. That, I think that. That's very important. You know, it's just like we get too excited when we get a call that ah, this guy is good. No one is good. Nobody. You know? I agree. I tell everyone dip, 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 check, inspect, educate yourself, go online, look at pictures, you know, really like not to say like get your reefing black belt stripes, but you, you got to really, you know, do your research and, and get it in there. You um, stay with it, you know, you got to stay on top of it. So. so so I want to um I just I still can't believe that we've been talking for almost an hour and fifteen minutes. It feels like we just started like five minutes ago. But I just there there's there's a lot of questions, right? There's been a lot of questions that I just didn't even get into yet. Um, people are asking questions, so I just think like for the next fifteen minutes or twenty minutes or you know maybe thirty minutes if we go that long, um, I want to you know let people ask questions. Okay, so what what. So what I'm going to do is um, I am going to wait for questions to come in. And then, uh, Joe, I'll basically just ask you the questions that come in. Absolutely. Um, yeah. All right, guys. So who has some questions for Joseph? Um, let's see what the first questions come in are. And if you asked a question before, you can re-ask it now because I'm sure it got buried um, in the in the thread here. Nobody's. I think there's a delay. Maybe that's why no one's asking any questions yet. We're still joining. Um, um, let's see here. Yeah, I think there's a delay. Okay. Uh, the first question is, what do you think the best dip for SPS is? I like the potassium chloride. Um, it's I, I, I've used Revive also in the past. Um, it's the It makes the water cloudy, so you don't really see, you know, what you're doing that's why i like the potassium chloride um now if you were i mean what is potassium chloride is basically um your salinity in your tank went to like uh, uh you know through, through the roof right then let's call it it i i think it's around 40. If, let's say you kept like 0 0.25 you know this is like 0 0.40 you know that's all it is um, and a fish would not be able to live. A coral will survive it, um, and the and flatworm obviously dies yeah. because it's an animal, right? So if you dip it and revive, the flatworm will not die. Mm. The flatworm will just come off your coral because it got irritated with the dip. So that's the difference, and it, at the same time, it's better than, um, you know, so, like, think about it. If you had flowers in your tank, but you had no fish, you could basically expose your corals in midair, like lower mm. your water, take a sprayer with potassium chloride, spray all your corals. They start to slime up. All those flatworms are going to be dead. The minute you fill up the water, okay, back, they're going to be all floated. You could almost get rid of them all of them at once the only difference is that you're not getting rid of the eggs so mm -hmm. there was a guy in japan who had done this in the in-tank treatment mm -hmm. and that's how he did it with potassium chloride but you will not be able to do that with revive and all these other mm -hmm. chemicals but you have to get rid of you have to take your fish out you can't do it in tank with fish in there um so that's all it is that's why i like potassium chloride yeah that's what we use 
use. I mean, unfortunately, I think if you do have flatworms, you know, and you have a really nice rock structure, you might have to, you know, frag everything, put it on racks and then dip racks for eight weeks um, so you could beat the egg cycle. But all right, the next question that we have um, is from John Lopez, and it's how much calc wasser do you dose a day? Um, I'm using calc wasser basically as my auto top off. So basically I do one minute per hour, you know? So I, I think I do 18 hours. Let me think because then the cock stares, the cock stares at midnight. No, I do less. The cock, the, the cock, the reactor stares the clock washer at midnight and then I have I think three or four hours that nothing happens for the clock to settle back down um, so if you take for 24 hours you take five hours that's one minute per hour that's what I do okay. um, yeah I mean there are guys who don't care if they dose that white milky stuff I don't think it's right. You're supposed to dose the clear part and the crust, the encrustate, you know, on the surface. Um, I've never done that, like white powdery paste stuff in the tank. It scares the hell out of me. Um, but um, I'm just doing a minute, so maybe I'm doing, uh, you know, 18, 18 minutes per day. So whatever comes out in that one minute, I have no idea. In terms of MLs, but alkalinity from my calcium reactor, I'm doing um, 200 MLs per minute, and, and then I'm dosing another um, 400 MLs in 24 hours with soda ash. Mm. Because I was having an issue with my calcium, for my calcium reactor to maintain my alkalinity, my calcium was like skyrocketing. So I had to lower my calcium reactor to make my calcium levels where I want them, but then alkalinity was too low. So I had to dose liquids with that separately. Um, my magnesium, I don't, it's from my calcium reactor. It's always on the 1400s because whatever skeleton, I use the reborn. That's what's mm -hmm. coming out of it. Um, so that's basically my regimen of all of that. Um, awesome. My suggestion with Cockwasser, if you don't need to use it, don't. And so why, you can maintain I, I'm just, why do you use it? I mean, if you just, because I guess someone's I got, probably wondering. Because I got so much coral that i need to, to help with others you know with your calcium reactor can't keep your calcium reactor can't keep yeah, up basically i can't keep up and that's why i do it i calc washer scares the hell out of me so did you ever think about maybe instead of calc washer like supplementing maybe with like a two-part for example which i am i am doing kind of like the the the, the alkalinity i'm already using one of those two parts you know, so I, I've, I, I push that around, like get rid of the calcium reactor and go three part, mm. which I did when I started out, which they call the bowling method back in Europe. Um, but it's very costly. I mean, it's very, very expensive. I mean, the calcium reactor, when we came out with them back in the day, 15 years ago, um, people were afraid of it because you have a CO2 tank in your house, you're going to blow up. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, uh, um, it was the best thing that ever invented because it was cheap. I mean, yeah. so when you, with three part, you mean Al Calc and Mag, right? Or is there? Tropic Marine sell that individually. And yeah, that's yeah. the bowling method. Believe it or not, that will blow out anything that we're using. Yeah. So I dose, but, I mean, for me, I don't use, I don't use a calcium reactor. We use the ESV, the Alk Mag. The alk, calc, and mag. Um, so yeah, that, that's how we do it. So let's let me get to the next question. Um, the next question is from 
is actually from Burnt Squirrel, and they ask, how long do you typically wait after mixing your salt before you use it? Um, I'm, I, I have a 60-gallon mixing tank that is ready 24 hours a day. So I don't mix a salt, let's say, batch to do a water change with it. Now, there were questions about that, like if you're mixing it too early and, and leaving it mix, you know, my pump in the mixing tank is 24 hours a day. So that water is available all the time. So to, to his question, I don't, I, I can't answer it because it's not like uh, mixing it and then waiting two hours and then doing a water change. You know, I could be mixing today and use it two days from now, you know. Um, but that goes, I believe, that is well for Tropic Marine Pro. But I had heard it's not good for other soils. For some reason, something happens to that soil. You mean if know. you let it run for too long, like Right. Like if, Before it, if it's running for three days and then, then you use it three days later? Right. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to ask that question too. Like, do you think that, you know, if you have it mixing for like a week or something and then you use it, is it bad? I did not see any ill effects doing it that way. And again, this I've been doing it, you know, for all these years. Um, when I do a water change, I normally use maybe 30 gallons, you know, depending if I clean my, my grow out tank and siphon the trilis from my grow out tank, maybe during that time I use 40 gallons out of 60. And then I fill it up, and I, again, I add new salt. And so there's always at least, I would say, a, from the time I do the water change to the time that the whole tank fills up, um, there's always, I would say, four days of mixing the new batch. And um, do, you, do, you, um, do you ever, like, power wash your, uh, you know, your, your drum? Yes, um, that's a good question because I tested with other salts. One time I, was, I said, you know what, I want to use another salt um, to see if I see any difference. Because there was a study one time that it's good to switch salt for a short period of time and then go back. <laughs> and let me tell you, it was the biggest mistake I did because <laughs> um, my tank became brown and black Ooh. from this soil, which I'm not going to mention the name. And I'm like, wow. What was the name? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's good. That I'm joking. Takes okay. back, that takes me back to another thing where have you ever tested five states in the, in the new batch mix? No one does. Or nitrates? I do. And in certain salts, there are phosphates. Hmm. So you're doing a water change to re reduce nutrients while you're adding them again. While you're adding them again. No, but what I mean is, like, let's say, for example, your, you know, your, your drum that holds the 40, 60 gallons, do you yes, ever, like, I literally take that outside and power wash that, you know? Power wash it, fill it up with water and bleach, empty it, Fill it up again, prime it, empty it, and uh, yeah, I do, I do it. I do it. Uh, lately, I haven't done it as frequent, but I did do it when I messed around with salts. You know, Tropic Marine Pro, one thing about it is expensive, but it's probably the cleanest salt out there. Um, and so do you ever do that also for your, RO, for your, your RODI top-off bin, or you never done that? Um, I don't have a bin. So basically, what do you do? So basically my RODI, um, you know, when I do the top off, I have it hooked up straight on a solenoid into the, um, Kalkwasser reactor. So when I want to dose Kalkwasser, basically the solenoid is on my apex where 
It comes on for one minute and allows new RO to go into the reactor and from the reactor comes out the Kalkwasser into the tank. So you don't store fresh? No. Like not? Huh. No. It's a little dangerous how I do it because you could create a flood. Or well, well, let me ask you ask you this question too because or, or when you make time when the stomach gets stuck open i'm gonna keep dosing cock wasser but then i'm gonna see it on my apex that i check maybe every 20 minutes <laughs> so wait you're, you're saying that the, the the fresh water comes directly from your your reverse osmosis unit correct so you don't think that you have to flush out the unit every time you're making a new batch of water then i guess no because it's um why why do you have to to do that you don't need to do that if you keep your your ro units clean number one you know and change your filters properly as they need to be um your tank is clean that's the tubing going to the calquasser i mean it, you, like i said i don't recommend to you know people do what i do because this is not um it, it's a little dangerous yeah. You know, because I'm, I'm ba my whole thing is based on a solenoid that if it goes bad, and I know that, and it tells me why are you doing this, you know what? I don't believe in the thing breaking <laughs> if you do them right. Knock on wood right now because, you know, you never know. <laughs> Knock on wood. <laughs> oh, man. All right. The next question, Um, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm going to ask this one real quick, and if we don't get it, we'll just move on to the next one. But what is your take on that one exit? So I'm not sure what that meant. What, what is your is my... What is your take on that ocean deep underscore aqua aquaria said? What is your take on that one exit? So I'm just going to skip that one for now, and then if you want to re-ask that question when it comes up later, we'll we'll go into it. Um, next question is how many MLS of backdo balance daily? I'm doing about I believe I'm doing like only four mLs. Um, per day, between four or six, something like that, um, of, of that back to balance. I would recommend that you start it with, depending on the gallons of, of, and depending also on your nutrient levels, um, start slow, see the effects, and then go up as you see the effects. So, um, you don't go too high that you strip your water because again, if you have nutrients that you want to you, you want to lower, you don't want to lower them overnight either. You know, you want to lower them slowly. So, you know, uh, nutrient levels being high, they creep up slowly. They also should be taken down slowly. You know, don't uh, don't try to say. Well, I got it. You know, you know, my nutrients are perfect, and then you're gonna see something, you know, having negative effect because you did that. Makes sense. So, All right, let me see what the next question is. Um, I kind of skipped the line, so now I'm going back. I think I'm here. Let's see, guys. Sorry, I'm like on my cell phone, like scrolling down. Um, question. I have tested, let's see here, sounds similar. It's going to find any question, I guess. Um, thought I was sketchy with a gravity feed 55-gallon drum. Um, don't you have a buoy in your sump that turns off the fresh to DI? No, you didn't like little fishy salt. Oh, sorry. sorry. Going through. People are just commenting. Water. <coughs> Why change to two little fishies? I hear you. Um, let's see here. I don't know if there's any more. Uh, it's different in the tank. Ah. Uh, so, oh, someone asked, "What do you use?" I think we we mentioned this, but what do you use for water top off if those drums are used for salt water? I think we kind of went through that one right yeah i don't have uh top off everything is direct so water top off drums so basically my my water mixing tank 
is always a mixing tank. And my water top off is directed to the um, colic reactor and to the tank. So I don't have a tank in between. Okay. One question from Freedom World. Um, with the colonies you have and depth of your tank, how do you maintain flow throughout? And will you need to add more lights? Um, flow to me is not as an important method as it is to a lot of people. Okay. But again, keep one thing in mind. Remember that my tank for folks that don't know, my tank is also a closed loop. So, so I got flow coming from the bottom up. I got flow going low into the rock work and then I got power heads, you know, meeting somewhere in the middle and creating that turbulence. So flow not necessarily have to be, I mean, think about it this way. If you had a power head pushing flow into a coil, it's going to burn. It's going to kill that coil. So what you want is water movement. Let's call it, right? So if you have water movement and you're creating undertow turbulence and, and, and upper so there, you know, it, it, your tank becomes like a mixing tank. Your cores are getting movement around. That's how I create flow when, it be, you know, with colonies like that. The other the reason I suggest that is that think about it this way, right? What happens when two cores touch each other? They kill each other. What happens if you have a mixed tank, LPS and SPS, and you have a, uh, uh, this beautiful big letter colony, and you have a power head, you know, hitting that letter colony, and then it's going to an SPS core, okay? The toxins and all that crap that, that could go from one to the other can kill corals. So I don't believe in, like, direct water movement. I believe in, in a circulation. As a matter of fact, I have a a a, a, um, uh, a wave maker on my closed loop, where all my closed loop system is like the wave maker turn and it sends water from this side to this side to the other side to the other side, not all of them just all the time going up. So that's my belief in flow. You know, a lot of guys oh, I want to blast power heads. You know, SPSs you know, gonna grow faster. What a coral does with a lot of flow, it doesn't cross the water, right? So you see a coral that is number one, thicker, that's because it got direct flow and a lot of it. If you see a coral that's encrusting, I mean, I get, I get people asking me questions. My coral is encrusting on the whole tile, but it's not shooting up. Again, too much flow. It's like, it's like a tree with a lot of wind. If, if it doesn't create big roots, it's going to go down. So corals have a lot of these theories kind of a thing um, that you could almost match them with above the ocean versus below the ocean. Um, so that's, that's to, to, to my buddy there. Um, <laughs> um, it, it's... It, it, Flow is important, but not as some people think it is. It, it's it. You need movement. Let's call it. You know, I mean that's my theory. Again, some other person will tell you, "No, my uh, my tank, I found better success," which is very possible. You know, I do have power heads, but the way I time the power heads. And their 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 program is that when this one is low, this one or the one that's facing it could be you know higher. So I want them to meet somewhere here, you know. And then later in the day, I want them to meet somewhere on this side, you know. Not always the same, you know. Um, and and, and I find it uh, that it's 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 good enough and. Some cars don't want, don't want a lot of flow, you know. Um, uh, I don't think like the smooth skins, red dragons, things like that, gonna want to have a lot of flow. Um, 
Is that also like the speciosa? Would you kind of consider that like a smoother skin? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so let's see here. I see some some questions. I think it's just talk in between. Um, Andrew from Polar Reef says Polar Reef involvement question mark. Not sure if that was a question or a comment. Um, yeah, someone says. I, I do work at Polar Reef. Oh, is um, that what he was referencing? Yeah. Okay. I um, I have to say, I am a very lucky person. I'm, I don't even know if what to say. Uh, honored, humbled, lucky. I, I do know that I'm a very lucky man to be there involved with Polo Reef. Um, it is an amazing place, amazing facility. Andrew is beyond um, anything anybody can imagine. Besides being nice, he's also very knowledgeable. The, the, if you want to talk about a die-hard hobbyist reefer, that's Andrew. Um, the, 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 the people that work there, it's one big happy family. And what I find and why I say I'm lucky is because there's so much that I am still learning and want to learn more that it gives me the opportunity to see it, experience it, um, test it, try it. Um, it's, it's it's amazing. I mean, I was with Polo at Aquashella this past weekend, and the interaction with people that we met, um, people that visited us, and and trying to learn about the hobby and what is Polo about. Polo is about giving back to the hobby, you know, and, and that's what Andrew is about. Um, as much as a big hobbyist that he is, but Andrew's key to this whole thing that, that he's doing. I mean, listen, the man doesn't need to go and spend all this crazy money. <laughs> you know, I mean, he can enjoy his beautiful tank, not one, I mean, a million of them, um, and so many more coming that will, those will be, you know, uh, later on. Um, but he wants to give to the hobby because he feels the hobby was good to him. And it's funny because one time I said to him, Andrew, tell me, uh, how is the hobby good to you when a coral dies? And he started laughing. He goes, well, listen, one dies, then live. Right. So it, it, it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. I, I can't say enough about it. And like I said, I, um, I'm a a very lucky person to be part of it and um because like i said there's a lot of big stuff to come out later that i can't speak about um which it's about education it's about more um research that 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 andrew keeps digging for and that that look at it this way in a big, massive amount of water volumes and big, massiveness of pumps and lighting and, and pipes and, and, and water turnaround, and, you know, it, it creates things that you can analyze, you could study on a big volume. Now, when you really think of about it, that same thing is happening to our small tanks, but we don't we don't notice them the same way. But they're there, and that's why I was saying to you with people who, let's say, don't do water changes, you know, because of the moonshiners and stuff. Um, there could be small problems happening in that water column in your tank, and you, you don't know because you you can't test for it. And these are things that I'm learning, you know, at Polo, that we're, we experiment on a lot of stuff. And um, I saw that, um, not to just jump right in, but the one thing I was really excited about as a, as a hobbyist myself is, is what you guys are going to be doing in the lab. I know that that's something that you guys have just built out. And I think that you'll probably, you know, do everything you're talking about, right? Different right. experiments. And, there is a lot yeah. of experiments. 
experiments that we are already like looking into if it, if it is how to um, deal with yellow in compass. Like for example, like there are studies, and again, these are not proven yet, um, which we will, you know, be checking on. It's like algae reactors, when the algae is growing, they do release nitrogens also in the water that could turn into bad bacteria, right? So now we all know that we want to be on the good side of, of, the, of the bacteria, which is having a lot more good than bad, right? But um, so there are things like that. And um, yeah, yeah it, it, it's, it's, I mean, I tell you, I spent uh, three days with uh, the Polo team in Florida. We were all there. Um, I, I was in, in, in heaven. Uh, I was like, uh, like, I didn't want to even, I, I didn't want the show to end. Um, and it's it's all good. It's a great group of people. Um, you, you could go from top down. I mean, I don't want to mention names because I don't want to forget anybody. And then, you know, he says, "Well, you mentioned everybody, but you forgot me." But it's a, it's a whole. It's not just one person. It's a, it's a it's a chain. You know, it's a chain of people that everybody does their job, and um, and and we're all focused for one thing. You know, and that's yeah. how many like uh, how many systems you guys have over there. I mean, I don't even know if you have count them oh, all, but my God, there is. Um, we have we have a lot of we have a lot of water. There is at least uh, in the lab alone we have now four quarantines. We have two two fifties with SPS. We're, we're Hey, I think we just lost your audio. Um, I think we lost your audio. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. You're back. Um, we we have um, we have four quarantine, two two fifties. Um, we lost your visual. <laughs> there you yeah, are. Because I have to I have to charge this thing. Um, in the back, we got another three tanks, three hundreds. That's without the fish quarantining. Then we have system one, which is um, quarantining slash cleaning. Um, that's besides the tanks that we're going to be putting in the lab that's still being worked on. That's besides the 900 gallon tank that's going to be in the front. That's besides another <laughs> 200 gallon cube in the office. And that's, you know, that's. That's not mentioning the 2,500 gallon tank in Andrew's office. I mean that that I, that tank is going to be a state of the art, even a state of the art. The 17,000 is that's going to be even more of a state of the art. So we're we're doing things and testing things at the same time. I mean. Um, Jonathan from Country Critters, you know, obviously is mine building all of these and they're very smart man. Um, he has ideas that we're, 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 we're trying to, they could be things in the market later on, to be honest with you, but things that I can't speak about. Yep. No, so, we're definitely, it, 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 uh, we're looking forward yeah. to it, you know. You know, so that, that, that's the reason why I'm saying I'm a very lucky man to be involved there and, um, and, and work with with Andrew and and everybody. It's it's one big family. I call it. Um, That's great. Yeah. No. We'll definitely be. Uh, you know. We'll stay tuned to some future uh, progressions. Um, you know, from Polo Reef. And like I said, I'm very interested, and I can't wait to see what comes out of out of the lab there. Yeah. Um, yeah. The, the lab is um, is the next thing that will be uh, sooner than later. Um, uh, it's. Um, it, 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 it's it's there are things that I would love to tell share, but that's not my department. Um, I'll, I'll have to come in person for the, to, our one of our podcasts to get all those secrets. Andrew would love to have you. I mean, uh, you know, you have been good to Andrew and and Paulo yourself, so um, I'm sure you'll be very very welcome. Yeah, we'll we'll definitely come.
I'm out there. Um, let me just jump to the next question because I know um, you know there's some people that are, are dying to get some questions in. So the next question is, what is the best way to remove nutrients? Is it an algae scrubber or a refugium or a skimmer? Well, skimmer is a must no matter what. You know, uh, I mean, he, he, he does a lot more than removing nutrients. It's also helping you with, with oxygen and, and so on and so forth. So um, I've never had an algae scrubber. I wish, to be honest with you, I have tried them. I, 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 I wish I tried it. I do have an algae, um, the, the Pax Balaam algae um, reactor, let's call it. Um, I never had a refugium. I don't know that I would do a refugium. You know, I've heard good things. I've heard bad things. Um, but if, if you like an algae scrubber, it works. They work fine, too. You know, so I, uh, to the question, I would maybe stay away from the refugium um, versus the other two but the skimmer you gotta have now if you have low nutrients and you choose to put a skimmer on a timer per se say um, if you don't have the buildup you don't have the animals you don't have a lot of fish and you want to put a skimmer to come on every other hour or six hours a day that's you, you could do um, mm -hmm. but as nutrients my, my thing is that control the nutrients at an early stage. Keep an eye on it. You know, we, we tend to forget about them until we're in trouble with them. And then we're trying to figure everything and then to lower them. And then once we lower them, that piece of equipment, that whatever that is, it's in our system, right? So if you maintain them earlier on, you might not need all of that, you know. Um, think about it. If you have a uh, algae scrubber, what are you going to do? You're going to uh, run it, turn it off when you don't need it, turn it back on when you need it, turn it back off. When you, you know, so balance the nutrients as you're building your tank. Like I said, like add one fish, add a coral, add one fish, add a coral. If you have the right balance, you might not even need a lot of this equipment because the nutrients that the fish are, let's say, generating, your corals are feeding on. Mm -hmm. So, um, like they say, oh, I have zero uh, nutrients. Some people will tell you, add more fish, feed more, right? Um, or maybe you have no nutrients because your, your equipment that you're using to remove your nutrients are too big or too efficient. So... It's how you want to. It's how you want to do it. You know, um, I, I certainly didn't do it like I'm saying. I'm doing this from experience. But um, uh, to that guy's question, definitely skimmer. Yes, I would say do an algae scrubber. Being that I didn't do it because I think they do work very well. You know. Awesome. Um the next question, and we're, we're, we're going to start winding down now, um, so we'll ask a few more. Let's see what else pops up. Um, the next question is, what par, this is a good one, what par in your experience is, is good for SPS corals? Um, <clears throat> I do run metal halides and T5s on my display, and I just did the Lumina Magic on my grout which i love you know I, I can't tell you how much i love these lights compared to what i used to have to burn the radios but um i find that sps like 350 to 400 is where you, you should be um now with that being said 350 to 400 leds i don't know i i think i can can push maybe 600 700 on halides like i'm doing and it doesn't do any damage but if you were to do that with an led i guarantee you're going to kill the call so i would stay 350 to 400 now yeah. uh, also 
I'm going to throw this in there. Um, because people also forget what is your nutrient level with that par, right? How clear is your water? You know, you have, and that's where I get to the yellowing compounds, and that's where I get to all of that other stuff. You know, how is the light penetrating the water? Is it, you know, so everything plays a little role. Um, but let's stick with the par thing. 350, 400, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. You know. Okay. Let me get to the next one and let's see if there are any. Glad you guys are bringing it up. Um, 2,500 in the office tank. Um, let's see. 2C insane. Uh, and you with the hearts, but you kind of. Okay, um, this is one question that someone has. Um, it's Zoo Reef. Is do you have any tips for polyp extension? Um, hmm. I know people ask me that question, and what is the answer to that? There is no answer to that. Um, I do have good polyp extension and i think i they tend to say that the reason is number one no pests okay you know you're not going to have polyp extensions if you have pests number two you have no fish nipping on the corals you know and number three good water chemistry the last thing is that if you're overfeeding your tank, you think your corals are going to have extending, extending to feed? Probably not. Like, when do we see a scoli, you know, extending, you know, its, its tentacles looking for food, you know, when it's hungry? You know, so SPS is some of them, not all. Um, I mean, if you took a millie, millies are always happy. They want to extend, you know. Some teniuses, um, they do extend more than others, depending on the parameters. Um, other corals don't extend at all. Um, but, but I think the biggest piece is no pests, no biting, you know, picking from fish, clean water. Um, and what a good water chemistry, and the rest happens by itself. I'm not. I, I'm not a magician. It's not like I'm using. Because I've I've been asked this question: What do you use that you have such polyp extension? I guys, I really don't. I'm not holding back. Uh, you know, from giving out any info because I'm. It's that's not me. I'm not that type of a guy. Um, it, it's really those things. I think. Um, and uh, when I see no polyp extension on my corals, and that's the reason why I always says, look at your tank. It's, it, it's, it pays to pay attention. Um, I, knew, I know something is off. If it's a chemical too high or a chemical too low, um, or something is off. I mean, I did notice that if you have, let's say, alkalinity around 7.0, Point three zero. I have certain polyp extension versus if I have alkalinity at 8.50, you know. So the best polyp extension that I have is always between keeping alkalinity between 7 and, and 8. Um, why? I have no idea. So, you know. But, uh, that you know, keep, keep keep an eye on the on 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 pests. I mean, red bugs is a very common thing that it annoys the coral. It doesn't kill the coral. It annoys the coral and it holds the coral from having polyp extension. Um, flatworms definitely. Um, other than that, it's water chemistry. So. That brings us into to the next question, actually, by uh, 
and let me know uh, Joe, if at some point you have to go because we've we're burning the midnight oil now with I keep going to midnight. <laughs> we're, we're we're at the after party now. But um the <laughs> next question actually which was perfect um right after the one you just mentioned about the alk is Tommy P asks regarding alk how much uh swing is considered an alk swing. I always believed one point is a max. Um now, I've had swings in the past, and I've had swings earlier on that I had to pay the price for it, and there were also other times that I didn't. And the difference was, um, what do you do with a swing? Most of us panic, right? Um, because we broke the routine of our number. So when we panic, we do stupid things. So if you had a swing of going up, okay, don't bring it down so fast. You know, it, it's up. It went up. It, 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 there's nothing you could do. So let's say you want to keep your water at 8 DKH and it went to 9. It went to 9.5. Okay, that's no different than, okay, it went up too quick. So if you were doing it that you wanted to go to nine and a half, you would have been bringing it up slowly, right? You, you would, I would say one point swing in 24 hours is not as des de detrimental as if you brought it three points in 24 hours. That's, that's bad. So bring it down slowly, you know. Don't bring it down the same it went up because that's too much for the coral to handle. It's just like you slapped it in the face. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, um, but one point, the question is one point swing is I would consider still safe. If you get more than that, you know, you could have some, some, some issues, you know. I don't think you'll kill the corals but you could do, you could have a little RTN or SDN, let's say, you know, but one point. One point, okay. Next question um, is by DASR1175. Uh, what is your thought, Joe, on pH? Is it something important to chase that number? Well, when I started out, Jason from Greenwich Aquarius said to me, don't chase numbers. And I never did. You know, never did. Um, my pH and my tank in me, the majority of all the years that I've been in the hobby has always been very low. So, I mean, you've seen my tanks through the years. I mean, I think I always had success. So I don't know that pH played any factor being that my pH was always low. My tank is in the basement. So, you know, air, you know, my house is, I built my house 20 years ago, so it's tight as hell, you know. So, uh, you know, there's definitely not enough, you know, oxygen and stuff. So in a basement, um, I do have a line from outside going to the skimmer. I do have that. Um, and lately, when I did the, and that's another reason why I do the caulk is because I wanted to play the pH game. I started chasing the pH number, right, to see if it makes a difference. Um, I've been pushing pH now um, at night at 8.15, you know, which is considered when before I was like at 7.50 um, and during the day it goes up to like 8.4 so that's that's pretty good numbers do I see a difference honestly Shane no no <laughs> I, I don't know that it does anything um, and again we're talking about one one item so is it something else that's doing the rest you know, and, 
And is pH affecting other things or pH by itself versus pH with something else that have more success? So in my case, if let's say my water quality, my chemistry, whatever, had always been up to par, I don't, I don't think pH is going to matter mm. where it is. So that's, that's the way I see it. Okay. Um, I think that was kind of the last question. So I guess we'll, we'll kind of wind down. Um, I do still have the gift card to give out. Um, one question that I have is, I, how did you get your nickname, Tusi? I, I probably should know this, but I don't. Well, when I was a kid, um, my father was always a, a merchant mariner so he was never home um my uncle used to pick me up to take me to school and he started calling me tusi so he used to say come on tusi let's go and that's the nickname it stayed tusi all my life and everybody knows me by that name and in honor to my uncle who had passed away at a young age i want to carry that name in everything I do because respect that out, out of it, you know, for him. So, but that's, that's basically it. It does mean something. Um, actually, I talked to Ashella, someone, um, it was Cuban Reefer, I think, mm. um, that, that I met. He, he came up to me and he said, hey, Tusi, he goes, uh, and then, you know, we started talking. He told me it means something to drug dealers or something. <laughs> yeah, it's not a very good thing. So <laughs> we don't want to talk about that on your show. Okay. Um, <laughs> but that's where it came from. Nice, nice. Yeah, I was just wondering. So, all right, guys, this is um, the time now when I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give out the $150 gift card. Um, this is going to be a question that we kind of – ask very early on um big shout out also to some people on here like greg carroll i mean he's definitely been on here from like the very beginning i've noticed sure. that you thank you so much um hopefully in the future we'll have greg on our show as well um but one of the questions that i i'm gonna ask right now um whoever gets this question right the first person to answer this question is going to win a 150 dollar gift card and the question is so i'm going to ask this question now and you have to answer the question. The first person to answer will win the gift card. The question is, what is the name of the supplement that Joe uses for his trace elements? <laughs> Boom. They got it right off the bat. Andrew Jones, you're the one who won the $150 gift card. So you will definitely uh, send me a DM. And you know what? Since we're, we're kind of going second round here, usually our, our shows are an hour, um, but this one has been two hours. So I'm going <laughs> to give a second $150 gift card. <laughs> um, this one, though, is going to be for the people who were here uh, within the last half hour. And this was also a question that somebody asked during the, uh, you know, but I didn't ask this question because it was already answered. <laughs> the question is, and this is, there's a range here. You probably already know what it's going to be, but what range does Joe like his elk to be at? What range does Joe like his elk to be at? It's a range. You have to get the exact range. I know there's a delay. So let's see uh, who, what range does Joe like his elk at? Yes, yes, seven to eight. So EST Corals, you are the winner. Um, so you guys who are the winners, just DM me after this, and I might not respond till tomorrow, but I'll definitely give you guys the gift card. Um, so that's it, guys. We really appreciate you guys being on the show. You know, we're, we're not trying to sell anything here. We're just giving out information. So if you did like this show, um, share this, guys. Share the show. It's the only way for people to find out about it. Um, eventually people will be able to listen to it on podcast form, uh, you know, Spotify, Audible and all that. So if you are listening to that, please share the show. And um, after the show, I'm going to post, I'm going to, Joe, I'm going to tag you on the, this, um, and then you can basically memorialize it onto your wall. Yeah. So 
Yeah. So anyone who who liked this, guys, please just go back into that in about a half hour and just share, share, share. Um, and yeah, these are recordings, so you will be able to go back into our walls, our Instagram walls, and re-listen to this. Or if you're coming in late and you want to listen to the whole thing. Um, so yeah, man, thanks so much, Joe. I, I really appreciate it. And um, yeah. I, I thank you because, you know, you're the one that bringing this to all of us, me included, because, you know, you do have other guests that um, I do listen to. Have, look, everybody have different experiences and everybody is right in their own ways. And, um, uh, you know, so I thank you and thank you for having me. And um, it's been a blast. I mean, I love talking about reefs. I, I hope I can help others. Um, and yeah, I mean, we'll do it again. <laughs> Yeah. One, and one last question before you go, you know, I kind of ask everyone this question, you know, it might be a strange one, but out of all the stuff we go through, you know, we're, we're up at night, we're thinking about what can go wrong, you know, where something goes wrong, like, like at the end of the day, like, is it all worth it? Is it all worth it to you? We don't do it because of the worth, I think. I think we do it because of the love, you know. I think we do it because we love what we what it is so what is that love what it is if it's the love to marine biology if it's the love you know with a with the fish versus coral we do it for the love um no it's not worth it it's far from, from <laughs> it's, it's far from being worth it but going to a bar getting drunk is it worth it waking up the next day with a hungover, going, doing drugs, killing yourself. Is it worth it? So, you know what? When you look at it like that, yes, it is worth it. For the actual money that we spend, you know, and, f you know, failures. We all have failures. Guys, don't think, um, you know, um, didn't have any failures in, in, in keeping reef tanks or grow, you know, growing SPS versus this versus that for fish. Believe me, I had a lot of failures. Um, but that's where I get um, more into it because I'm, I'm pretty anal, perfectionist, whatever, you, whatever it is. When I fail, I I want to succeed on that even more. So I will continue to do it. I will challenge myself to be successful in it. And again, if you took this hobby, and that's what I tell little kids, if you are able to be disciplined, this can teach you a lot of things growing up in life because it, it makes you be somebody that can help you um, in your career, if you want to become a stockbroker, right? What do you need to do to become a successful stockbroker? You need to do research. How do you do research? It's like you're doing research about flatworms to succeed in growing cause. It's the same thing. So it does teach you to become um, a better person, in a sense. So that's what I like about it. Um, it's love it's we love doing it and i mean people ask me how can you continue to love your tank working at polo reef you know someone asked me that question recently and i'm like what do you mean he goes because polo reef have everything so how could you still continue to love your own tank i'm like i don't get enough <laughs> of this <laughs> you know i can do this 24 hours a day and i'm still gonna have the same love today and tomorrow and the day after because i love it and and i think that's that's what it is um is it worth it but no it is <laughs> you know <laughs> to me I, I the love it is for the love it is you know awesome man all right guys that's all i got for you tonight um, see you guys all on the other side of this uh, call. Good night, everyone. Good night, and thank you, Shane. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.
We hope you're enjoying this episode. Thank you for listening to SBB Coral Reef Keeping Secrets Podcast. If you like the content, all we ask is for you to please share with your friends and comment, as that's the only way we can spread the word and grow this channel. 